Well, welcome everyone. I'm excited to share this morning. So I'm a product of the 90s and love music still from the 90s. My wife is more 90s country. I'm 90s rock. And one of the first bands I ever saw live was the band Oasis. They should be pictured behind us in a little bit. But if you remember Oasis, you might know some of their songs. They had songs like Wonder Wall, Don't Look Back in Anger, and they exploded onto the scene. They had two back-to-back albums that were kind of the biggest albums at the time. And it was so big that they were reminiscent to some people of another really popular British rock band you might know of called The Beatles. And it's kind of one of those terrible things. If you're a British rock band and you start to get big, you're inevitably compared to the Beatles. And you can't live up to that hype. It's like the next basketball player being compared to Michael Jordan. You you never quite become the next Michael Jordan. Well, Oasis kind of came onto the scene. They got popular and more popular. And most bands, when the comparison to the Beatles start, they try to push it to the side. They say, you know, no, we're not the Beatles. We're just trying to do our own thing. Oasis took a different route. In an interview with MTV, Noel Gallagher, one of the two brothers of Noel and Liam, said, we are bigger than the Beatles. (laughs) Two albums into their career, Noel says, we're bigger than the Beatles. And we sit 25, 30 years later, And I don't think anyone would argue that Oasis is bigger than the Beatles, even though I love me some Oasis still. Paul McCartney would say the death blow to Oasis was that comment. When they made the comment they were bigger than the Beatles, they put themselves on a pedestal they could not reach. Because sometimes our works don't match our words. You can make a bold proclamation like we're bigger than the Beatles, but if you only have two great albums, you're not quite bigger than the Beatles. This happens every year at certain drafts for sports where a new prospect will say, I am the next so-and-so. I'm going to come in and be all pro right away, and then you look at their career and it fizzles out. It's one thing to have bold claims. It's another thing to back them up. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to be in the Gospel of John in the second half of John chapter 10, where you really start to see a pivot in the story of Jesus' opponents and how they view him. Because this is a line in the sand text where Jesus is going to boldly declare who he is. He is going to use strong words to describe himself. And he's going to share about how his works back up those strong words. So that's what we're going to look at today. And to give you a backdrop, one of the things, as we've been walking through John, we've kind of said it's a book of festivals. There's always a festival happening in John. It's kind of like Milwaukee in the summer. There's always some sort of festival. And this festival is the festival of dedication. Or we know it today as Hanukkah which is interesting because it's actually never mentioned in the Old Testament because the festival of dedication or Hanukkah happens between the two testaments. It happens during this time. It celebrates this time during between the two testaments where the Jewish people were under harsh rule again. And the leader at the time wanted all Jewish religion pushed to the side. They wanted everyone to follow more a Hellenistic style of religion. And so they couldn't go to the temple. They couldn't offer sacrifices. And the Maccabee family, this Jewish family, raises up this revolt and takes back over the temple over this eight-day war or battle. And you celebrate this festival of dedication because it's the temple being restored, right worship of God, right sacrifice. So it's in the backdrop of this celebration about right worship right sacrifice that Jesus begins to teach again on who he is. What does right worship of God look like? Well, it looks like worshiping Jesus for who he really is. And so we're going to pick up in John 10, starting in verse 22. It says this, Then came the 
festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him were saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at this section of Scripture in four different acts. There's four different acts to this text. The first is the demand, which we're about to look at. The next is the response. Then there's the accusation and the defense. The demand, the response, the accusation, the defense. So first, the demand. What's the demand here? It starts with, it seems like a question. How long will you keep us in suspense? But it's not a question, really. It's a demand. They say, if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And this doesn't seem that outlandish, does it? Hey, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, just tell us. We just want to know. If you really are the one who's going to overthrow Rome, who's going to help the Jewish people no longer be oppressed, no longer be under their rule, tell us plainly. Let's have it not be so confusing. Don't use those parables you like to use. Just tell us. So that's the first demand. So how does Jesus respond? Jesus says this. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They shall never, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So Jesus responds to this demand by saying, listen to my words. I have told you. I've been telling you. If you look at the Gospel of John, Jesus in different ways tries to tell people he's the Messiah. And I can relate to Jesus a little bit here. As a parent, it feels like often I have to repeat myself over and over. I think about it with chores. I got this approved by my son. I'm going to use his and him as an example. So when we do laundry, we do our laundry down in our main level. We fold the clothes. We tell them, hey, make sure to take your laundry upstairs and put it away. Now, if I tell my kids one time, make sure to take your laundry upstairs and put it away, what will happen? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I have learned as a parent that I have to say it multiple times. So I tell him in the living room, Elijah, put away your clothes upstairs. And as he walks upstairs, I yell up the stairs again, Elijah, make sure to put away your clothes. Why? Because there's a mini basketball hoop up there. And I know he's going to get distracted right there. He'd be like, maybe I'll put away my clothes, but I could shoot a couple shots. He shoots a couple, and it turns into 15 minutes, and the clothes stay in the hamper right there. So I yell up at him again. He makes it to his room, and now we have an old house, kind of one where the, and the venting goes right from our living room into his bedroom, <laughs> which is sometimes a problem because he can hear what we're saying when we think he's in bed. But it works for this because it's kind of like a walkie-talkie. I can just yell up the vent, Elijah, put your clothes away. Because I also know that when he gets in his room, he's going to see some of his toys, he's going to see some other stuff, and he's going to get distracted again. So about three different times I need to tell him. And even still, sometimes, I come up later and the clothes are still sitting in the hamper. Because we need to say it over and over and over. And I feel like that's why I resonate with Jesus here. He's like, I have told you I'm the Messiah. I said it plainly to some people. When they ask, I just tell them, yes, I am. And other times I've given you every indication that I am. Think of the titles Jesus gives for himself. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the living water. He's not just saying that because he thinks he's a good prophet. He's saying, I am the Messiah. I'm the one who will redeem Israel. Come to me and you'll have life. He wants them to see, I am the Messiah. He's saying it over and over. So he's saying, listen to my words. But, he's, but he also says, that's not it. He also says, look at my works. Look at what I've done. Because I'm like Oasis, who said they were the greatest band of all time, the Beatles, better than the Beatles. Jesus actually backs it up. Think about it at this point in the Gospel of John. Now, we've been in John a long time. 
I realize we kicked this off in Advent. We're closer to another Advent than we are to the start of this series. So we've been in John for a while. But think of what's happened so far, the acts that Jesus has done. Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus healed the official's son from a distance. Remember that? The official's son was sick, and he came to him and said, come to my house, and Jesus said, no, he's good. Not even around him. Jesus walks on water, and even in that story, like somehow transports the boat to the shore like immediately. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with just some bread and fish. Jesus heals the paralytic at the pool, and Jesus heals a blind man. Look at my works. Look at what I've done. How could I not be the Messiah? That doesn't even account for the authority that Jesus taught with. Often they are marveling at, how is he, a man who's not trained, teach with such great authority? Jesus is saying, even if you don't understand that I've said that I'm Messiah, look at my works. What else would they be pointing to? And if not to, to kind of put, then drive the nail home one more time, he ends by saying, I and the Father are one. I think sometimes we can miss the boldness of this claim because we pull it out of its context a little bit and we think about it like how we say we're one with each other. The Olympics are about to come up and even though we're really divided as a country right now, when the Olympics come, we'll all start cheering for Team USA, and we'll say things like, we're one, we're united. And we think this is what Jesus means here. He and the Father are just united. But that is not what he meant. If you look at the way this text flows, what Jesus is saying is, I and the Father are one in character and in substance. He is saying that he is God. So the question was, are you the Messiah? Jesus says, yes, I am but I'm also more than that. And we know that because of the accusation that follows. If you look at the text, it says, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. They don't say that if Jesus just says, me and the Father are one, we're good. No, they know what he's saying. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father, for which of these do you stone me? And they responded, we are not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. The accusation is blasphemy, a mere mortal claiming to be God. And this is the shift in the text. It started out, just tell us if you're the Messiah, and now it moves in much more like picture to a courtroom scene. And I am a sucker for courtroom dramas. I love them. I love courtroom books. I love movies about them. So much so that when I was a lit, I was an English lit minor in college, I started out as an English ed major, and I would be in these upper level English courses. And I remember one time that a professor asked, What's, who is your favorite author? And so they go around the room and everyone's flexing with their favorite authors. So they're saying people like Dickens and Tolstoy and Wolf and Austin. Tolkien, and it gets to me, and they ask, who's your favorite author? And I say, John Grisham. (laughs) And you could have heard a pin drop, because that is not a very profound name to throw out there. It's kind of like being at an Oscars party, and being like, what's your favorite movie of the year? And being like, Transformers. (laughs) The Transformers movie was great. The plot, the acting, phenomenal. You know, like, when you're in an upper-level lit course, and you say, John Grisham's your favorite author, no one takes you seriously anymore. But I do love courtroom books. I'll still read them. If I don't have anything else to read, it's just like, all right, what John Grisham book book is free at the library. I'll take it. Because I love watching the defense make the case for what they do. Hillary has told me a few times, my wife, like when we're in arguments, you kind of talk like a lawyer. So I think it just, that's not a good thing. Uh, I don't think it's a compliment when she says it. But it's this idea, I love watching kind of how the prosecution states their case, how The defense states their case. And you see that a little bit here. You see this courtroom feel already. Because what Jesus said in the book of Leviticus, if it's blasphemy, it is punishable by death, is what they would have said in the Levitical law. It's not 
a small thing to say that you're God. That's why it said they picked up stones to stone him. Sometimes I wonder where were all these stones just sitting around? It seems like they were really ready to stone Jesus. But they pick up stones because that actually was the punishment. The accusation here matters. And I would say many people today, this is the same accusation. Jesus claiming to be God is this thing, this this line that people can't cross. They can take him as a good teacher, but when he claims to be God, that's crossing a line. And so you'll often hear people say, Jesus never claimed to be God. He was just a good moral teacher. But that is not what the whole of the Bible, and especially this text, tells us. So how does Jesus respond? What is his defense when the accusation is brought before him? Does he kind of backpedal or give a little spin? Or what does he say? He says this. says, Jesus answered them, it is, written in your, is it not written in your law? I have said you are God's. So he's talking about Psalm 182 here. And this is a passage we don't have time to unpack all of. But Jesus is using Scripture as his defense here. He's saying that in Psalm 82, it is said that God calls this group who is leading Elohims, or gods. He's saying if it's in the Scripture, and God uses that phrase, how is that blasphemy? And we'll go on and see what his argument further. It says, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came... And the scripture cannot be set aside. What about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said that I am God's son? So again, this, is, this can be a confusing text, but essentially what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, if you trust the scriptures, and for, for those who were not God, it uses the word gods, why would I be blaspheming if I, who am actually God, use the phrase God? That is his defense here. Scripture uses it for those who weren't gods. I use it, and I am the Son of God sent by God. Listen to my words, is what he's saying. Look at, listen to what I'm saying. I used phrases and said that I'm God, but it's not blasphemy because I actually am. But if you don't trust that, look at my works. What does he go on to say? Do you do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Listen to my words, but if it, even if you don't believe my words, look at my works. My works show you, not just that I'm the Messiah, but that I'm not blaspheming and claiming that I'm God. So how do Jesus' works show that he is God? Well, let's just look at a couple. First, we've walked through some of them that Jesus had already done in the Gospel of John. Let's think of the feeding of the 5,000. How would this show that Jesus is God? I think part of it you see even in the text in John 6, it compares it to another Old Testament miracle of the manna coming from heaven. In the manna coming from heaven... No one thinks it was Moses who had the power to bring the manna. It was always God who brought the manna. God was the one who told Moses the manna would come. Moses' role was simply to point the people to this coming and telling them the right way to collect the manna. When Jesus feeds the 5,000, there's a point where he looks up at the heaven looks into heaven, and he says, he says, he doesn't say, God, will you turn these bread and fish into a multitude so everyone can eat? So he looks up to heaven and says, thanks. Because he knows it's happening. Why? Because he has the power to do it. Unlike Moses, who needed God to act and the one to provide the manna, Jesus could provide the bread and fish on his own. He did it. He is not just like one of the patriarchs or prophets. He has the power in and of himself. 
Another example with bread is Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet finds this widow during the famine, and she, he asks her to make him some bread, and she's like, all I have is enough flour and oil to make some food for my son and I, and then we're going to die. It's pretty bleak. And God tells Elijah to tell the widow that God will make the oil and flour last, and she will never run out. Nowhere in that story do we think it was Elijah who had the power to make the flour and oil last. It was God working through Elijah. When Jesus performs a miracle, it is not God working through him. It is him as God performing the miracle. That is incredibly important. That's why he's pointing at the works. He wants them to see the difference in the works he performs. Think of another example of Jesus calming the sea. Go back to another example of Moses with raging sea, right? You have the Red Sea in front of Moses. God tells Moses, put out your staff and I will part the Red Sea. Not Moses, I, God, will part the Red Sea. Moses puts down the staff, Red Sea parts, they go across on the other side. No one thinks it was Moses who parted the Red Sea. It was God through Moses. Jesus finds his disciples on a raging sea, these experienced fishermen where the waves are crashing over the boat who are scared they're going to die. They go to him, why don't you care, Jesus? He looks at the sea and he says, peace, be still, and the sea calms. He didn't ask God, God calmed the sea. He just said, peace, be still, and it calmed. He had power over nature. This is not your typical prophet. Look at my works. When I say that I'm God, I mean it, and I've shown it. His defense is, look at what I've done. What I have done is backed up my words. And this is one of the hardest sayings, the hardest things for people to believe about Jesus. It is not hard for people to agree that Jesus was a great teacher. It's hard to argue with that. He's one of the most brilliant minds, philosophical, ethical, moral minds out there. Teachings that he has stated has transformed society for centuries. So people can get behind Jesus was a good teacher. But Jesus being God, that is the line people can't cross. It's been a struggle since the time of Jesus' opponents. The Roman world didn't want to believe it. We have the Enlightenment, where that took all of that out of Jesus' teaching. We see things like the Jeffersonian Bible, which we've heard about before, right, where Thomas Jefferson took out the supernatural because he loved the moral teachings of Jesus. He didn't like the supernatural. And we have it today. If I go out on campus... My wife and I are blessed to do campus ministry. If I go out on campus and we ask people, we have this outreach tool that we use where they can say what they believe about Jesus. And the most common things people will say is that he's a great spiritual teacher. But when you get to, is he creator and savior? Very few will say that. This is one of the most important things for us to think about. And I would say the big idea of this text is simple. If Jesus is God, it changes everything. If Jesus is God, it changes everything. That's why people wrestle with it. Because they know if he is God, it changes how they relate to him. It changes in multiple ways, right? And as we look at the text, we see the verdict of how people, if this is a courtroom again, we see how people respond. Starting in verse 39, it says, Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. So this one group wasn't convinced by Jesus. They try to seize him again. They try to put him to death again, but he escapes their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. You see, Jesus makes these claims about himself being the Messiah and being divine, And some believe and some don't. And that's the same today. But again, if he is God, it changes everything. 
That's why I say that. Let's go with the same way we've been talking about it. If we listen to his words and look at his works, it changes how we listen to his words because we listen to and trust in his words. If Jesus really is God, his words have a lot more weight. And this is a beautiful thing because it means his promises have more weight. We can rest in his promises because we know they're true if he's God. In this text alone, think of some of the promises that we didn't get to hit on. One where he says, no one will ever snatch you from my hand. The security in that. Have you ever wondered if God will give up on you? Had doubt that he would no longer love you? This text gives us great security. And because he's God, we can trust in that promise that no one will ever snatch us from God's hand. Or the promise of eternal life. You'll never perish. You have eternal life. In this text, it says that. What a promise for us to hold on to that we can rest in. Promise that we're his children, we're his sheep. Those are just from this text. But go on in the rest of the Bible, promises like, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and you will find rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want that promise to be true. How about you? So many promises that if Jesus really is God that I can trust in, that changes everything. And I think there's some of us, when we lose that view of Jesus being God, we don't really believe we can trust his promises. And we need to rest in those because there's a lot of lies coming at us left and right. So it gives us promises to rest in, but it also gives us commands to obey. And I think this is the part that people really don't like. Because if Jesus is God, we can't pick and choose what he says. We can't go through the Sermon on the Mount and be like, I love, blessed is the poor in spirit, but I don't like, love my enemy. So I'm not going to follow that. See, if I read a book on parenting, it's easy for me. I can look at what I like and be like, oh, I want to try to apply that. And if I don't like something, I'm like, I'm not going to apply that. When you read the Bible, you can't do that if Jesus is God. You can't look at his teachings. If he's just a good teacher, you can take some and set them aside. If he's God, you can't do that. I remember when I was working on the campus of University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, I was having a spiritual conversation with this guy. And I shared about Jesus with him. And at the end of it, he said, I can't trust this because if I put my faith in Jesus, I know he's going to ask me to change my life. It was the most honest answer I'd ever been given. But he knew, if Jesus is God, he's going to ask me to change some stuff, and I don't want to. And how many of us, even as followers of Jesus, pick and choose his sayings? I think of even that example of love your enemy. How are we doing at that? Do we really live that out? Or do we come up with reasons why we shouldn't have to? No. If he's God, we obey his commands. So it's beautiful. It's promises we can rest in, but it's commands we obey. So we listen to and trust in his words, and then we look at and we trust in his works. Because if we see Jesus as God and we see the miracles he performs, we can believe that we have a God who's powerful enough to do those things in our lives today. No situation is too hopeless. No situation is too small One of the beautiful things about Jesus is not all his miracles are big and miraculous. Sometimes it's just turning water into wine at a wedding. And sometimes we're like, why would I pray? God's got bigger problems than that. Why would I pray about this thing? But if we believe he's powerful, we believe he's God, and we believe he cares about us, he wants to move in a lot of different ways in our lives. So we're trusting that he is powerful. I heard a pastor once say, there's a lot of believers who are functionally atheists. Because they don't believe Jesus really is God and is powerful. Do we believe in his power in our lives today? And his biggest work of all, if he's not God, doesn't make any difference to us. If Jesus wasn't God, the cross and resurrection mean nothing. Paul says it, that it was just futile if it didn't happen. But Jesus being God is what makes it work. If... If it's just a mere person, if I went and died on a cross, it would do nothing for the rest of you. If he's God, though, 
That sacrifice can mean a lot more. If he's God, he actually can rise from the dead, have victory over sin and death. See, Jesus being God changes everything because we can look at his words, we can listen to them, and we can trust him. There are promises right now that people out there, that some of us, we just need to take hold of. We need to say, Jesus, I trust that you are God. And when you say all of us who are weary and heavy laden can come to you and find rest, I need to trust that right now. I need to quit going to other things to find rest. There's some of you right now that there are commands you need to obey. There's things in your life you just don't want to give to God. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it is a lie that you're living. I don't know. I know in a room this big, there's some of us who are just sitting here thinking, you know, if Jesus really is God, I've got to change this part of my life. I've been feeling the conviction, but I've been picking and choosing what parts of his teachings I follow. For others, it's, we need to trust that he is God and can do miraculous works in our lives now, big and small. And when we pray to him, we believe he can actually do it. So as we, as we move into a time of worship to close, I want you to think through, where are you at? Maybe you've never really believed that Jesus is God. Maybe that's been a hindrance to you trusting him. And hopefully this text gives you clarity that he did say it and that it's a beautiful thing that he is. But maybe there's promises you need to, to rest in today. You need to find hope in. Maybe there's commands you need to obey. But again, Jesus being God changes everything. And we as believers want to live that we serve not just a good teacher, but the Messiah, the divine Savior of the world. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you that we can rest in the knowledge that you are God. It can be hard for us. We can push back against it because often we want to be the God of our own life but we can thank you that we can rest in your promises. We can trust that your commands are good and we can have hope that you are a God who's powerful and at work and can move and work in our lives now. Amen.